Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Bruce Johnson. I'm the president of the Inner University Council. Uh, welcome, Governor. Thank you for being here. I'd like to uh, introduce our presidents, Jeff Bauer, Shawnee State, Craig Crawford, Miami, Todd Diakins um, from Kent State, Susan Edwards from Wright State, Christina Johnson from Ohio State, John Langell from Neomed, Gary Miller from the University of Akron, Rodney Rogers from Bowling Green State University, Hugh Sherman from Ohio University, and Jack Thomas from Central State University. So I want to welcome everybody. This is the IUC's press conference on hazing, and uh, I would also like to welcome Sherry and Col Corey Fultz. You know the Fultz family story, and they'll be talking to you a little bit later in the press conference. At this time, I'd like to recognize Rodney Rogers, President of Bowling Green State University. Thank you, Bruce. On behalf of Bowling Green State University, we certainly are pleased to play a role in presenting these anti-hazing principles today. Certainly want to thank my fellow presidents of Ohio's public universities and the Inter University Council of Ohio. The 14 presidents came together with IUC in a pursuit of the continuous work to do better to combat hazing on all of our campuses. This past spring, BGSU experienced the tragic loss of one of our students, Stone Fultz, and today we have his parents, Corey and Sherry, with us, and his aunt as well. Um, and I certainly want to acknowledge and sincerely thank them for all of their efforts over these past months. They were at the core of these anti-hazing principles. They made a promise to Stone that he wouldn't be left behind that he wouldn't be forgotten, and that no other individual is left behind in the future. And these anti-hazing principles certainly reflect that commitment. And while BGSU took action to hold the fraternity and those students responsible for these intolerable acts, we, we held them responsible. But uh, we also recognize that hazing at colleges and universities across the United States is far too common. And so uh, we share this responsibility to ensure that the health and safety of our community, especially our students, are, are, are focused on. And, and today is an important next step. We are focusing on a zero tolerance approach, automatic dismissal of students found responsible of hazing, all the way to increasing our education and transparency with our students, faculty, staff, parents, faculty, families, and alumni. 
Now we cannot certainly do this alone, and the collaboration with Ohio's universities continues to make such a significant difference. But I also want to make sure we thank Governor Mike DeWine, Senators Gavarone and Kunze, along with Ohio's legislature for leading and passing Senate Bill 126, Collins Law, named in memory of another tragedy at Ohio University with the death of student Colin Lyon. This state law now expands the definition of hazing and creates a variety of new criminal hazing offenses and imposes more serious penalties. Through today's announcement, including zero tolerance approach across all of our campus, we will help eradicate hazing. That is our goal, and BGSU remains committed to working with Chancellor Gardner, all of our peers, the Fultz family, and anyone across the state and the nation who shares in this mission. Thank you. Thank you, President Rogers. Uh, in June, all 14 public university presidents signed these new principles. And so to explain those new principles, I'll invite our vice chair, President Greg Crawford, Miami University. Well, thank you, Bruce, and good afternoon. Today, the Inter-University Council of Presidents stands in solidarity to eradicate hazing from the Ohio public university campuses. We declare our unwavering support of Senate Bill 126, introduced by Senator Teresa Gavarone and Stephanie Kunze. Thank you to these sponsors, and thank you to President Matt Huffman, Speaker Bob Cup, the members of the Ohio General Assembly, Chancellor Randy Gardner, and Governor Mike DeWine, for your support of Senate Bill 126. Your compassion, courage, and hard work ensures that our students are safe, healthy, and empowered to live fruitful lives and lead successful careers. And before I describe our support and the zero tolerance principles, I wish to acknowledge the Wyatt and Foltz families. We are grateful for your courage and compassion and efforts, and we will forever hold Colin and Stone in our hearts and thoughts, as well as all those families who have been impacted by the brutal of hazing. Every year, university students across the nation are harmed, injured, and even die due to senseless, cruel, and inhumane acts of hazing. Our IUC anti-hazing principles are designed to eliminate hazing through stiff penalties, robust collaborations, elevated oversight of our organizations, and a comprehensive annual reviews. Specifics of our anti-hazing principles include the following. Zero tolerance approach that imposes several sanctions against students, organizations, and individuals who engage in hazing. Automatic dismissal of any student convicted of criminal hazing and debarment from attending any Ohio public university in accordance with the state law. Working with law enforcement as a vital partner in combating hazing. Strengthening the role of advisors to student organizations. Educating families and alumni on hazing, including where and how to report it. Improving the content and delivery of anti-hazing education for our students. Providing data on hazing violations to inform students' decisions about joining various organizations. And offering a personal outlet for reporting hazing. By advancing our zero tolerance approach, anti-hazing principles and our strong support of Senate Bill 126 as a university-wide system, we honor the memory of Colin and Stone. We will do everything within our power to end hazing on our campuses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Crawford. <clears throat> I'd also like to recognize the Chancellor. Uh, Chancellor has been very active on, in this effort. He's uh, soon to convene a group to follow up on uh, the recent law that was passed, but we look forward to continuing to work with our chancellor uh, to try to eradicate hazing in the state of Ohio. Next, uh, I will introduce Dr. Christina Johnson from The Ohio State University to give her campus's perspective. Thank you, Bruce, and good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by reiterating our deepest condolences to the Fultz family who you will hear from shortly on the tragic loss of your son. Your bravery during this time of unimaginable grief 
and your commitment to preventing a tragedy like this from happening again is the reason we're all here today. Thank you. I also want to thank the Inter University Council of Ohio, our state legislature, Governor Mike DeWine, and Chancellor Gardner for their commitment to anti-hazing efforts like those announced today. We remain grateful to Chancellor Gardner for his urgency, and now is the time to set these principles forward. The principles that Ohio's 14 public universities have developed in cooperation with the Foltz family, joined Collins Law, signed by the governor earlier this month, as important steps towards eliminating hazing on our campuses. The Ohio State community grieves with the Foltz and Wyatt families and all who have lost a loved one or have been damaged by these criminal acts. We will continue to do everything in our power to eradicate hazing in the state of Ohio and beyond. Our universities exist to educate and, and develop tomorrow's civic leaders. This is our purpose. As a land-grant university, Ohio State's DNA is rooted in this idea. We have a mandate to improve the lives of families in the communities we serve. Hazing is the antithesis of these ideals. It stands in opposition to our principles and violates our deeply held values. We have an innate responsibility to reject it. What I like so much about the principles described by my IUC colleagues today is that we will do what we do best to combat hazing. We will educate. Not only will we take a zero tolerance approach to incidents of hazing on our campuses, we are already enhancing our ongoing efforts based on the IUC principles being shared here. Specifically, last week nine of our student life staff attended the Interdisciplinary Institute for Hazing Prevention training so that they can assess our university-wide hazing prevention education and develop a robust approach to educating our community about the horrors of hazing and how to end it. Our partners in hazing prevention include members from our sorority and fraternity life, student athlete engagement, student conduct, our student wellness center, the university office of institutional equity, student activities, the office of university compliance and integrity, and student leaders from across our sororities and fraternities on campus. In terms of strengthening the role of our advisors to students groups, we are requiring all student organizations to sign an anti-hazing pledge that also includes the signature of their advisor. As part of advancing Collins' law, we will put additional emphasis on hazing education, both in the initial required training curriculum that every advisor goes through and with regular information and training updates. Together, the IUC anti-hazing principles and legislation like Collins Law help ensure that we take a united approach to eradicating hazing. The changes made to the Ohio Revised Code as a result of Collins Law are advancing a statewide approach to educational efforts. Planning is underway right now for involvement in National Hazing Prevention Week in September with programmatic outreach key to providing education for our students, staff, and advisors early in the fall semester. Also, we're augmenting our communications about unrecognized or underground organizations, utilizing notifications on student iPads, Facebook, live Zoom sessions for families, and multi-channel promotion of the benefits of membership in recognized student organizations. In closing, as Chancellor Gardner said, and I quote, we can't wait any longer to address this issue head on and in close collaboration. That is why we're here today, and that is why we as university presidents came together to develop the IUC anti-hazing principles. The safety and well-being of our students and their families is fundamental to our mission as educators and citizens, and together as Ohioans, we can and will do more. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Johnson. Governor, it's been a great partnership. We very much enjoyed your support for the legislation. I know Collins family very much appreciated your support. We're very pleased that you've signed it. We also uh, look forward to working with you in implementation. Governor, your comments. Yes, thank you very much. Well, today uh, we remember uh, Colin, we remember Stone, we remember all those who have been victims uh, in the past of, of hazing. Um, we appreciate the work of their families enabling us to pass legislation here uh, in the state. Today we take one more step to drive hazing from the state of Ohio. When I signed this bill, I signed Collins' bill, uh, I said that this was a major step 
forward. But not only do we need to change the law, we need to change the culture. And to change culture is tough. But it's something we are going to change in this state. So I want to congratulate uh, 14 universities, and presidents, uh, who have really come together uh, to come up with best practices, who have come together to make a statement that this hazing is simply not tolerated in the state of Ohio. I want to also mention that I know many of our private colleges and universities are also working very, very hard uh, in this area as well. So this is something we all ought to be able to agree on. Hazing is just simply not tolerated in the state of Ohio. Uh, so again, I, I just want to congratulate our presidents. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with them for the last several years on a number of different issues. Um, they are, do an amazing job at their universities. They are the leaders of their universities. And so when the president of the university says, this will not be tolerated anymore, it means, means a great deal. I want to thank them for this. Thank you, Governor. We really appreciate those comments. I do want to invite Sherry and Corey Fultz to come forward and give their perspective. Let me just say this idea of zero tolerance started with the Fultz family, and I, I want to thank them for that. Come forward. Thank you. Thank you, President Johnson. Governor DeWine, thank you for all your support for this. This is a very important day in the effort against hazing on our Ohio College campuses. A personal thank you to Dr. Rogers and Natalie Jackson of BGSU for helping us get to this point. The principles adopted today by the IUC are a combination of a lot of effort on part of many people we sincerely thank you. However, the work is not done. The principles introduced today are critical. The keys to success will be in the policies and the procedures you create based on these principles and how well you keep your students informed and involved. The first principle is a zero tolerance approach. To our family, this principle is all about putting stronger penalties in place for individuals and organizations that participate in hazing activities, regardless of the degree of harm. The intent here is to send a clear message. You haze, you're expelled, and if you're part of an organized group, that group is remo removed from campus as well. You have heard us say before, hazing is abuse, and hazing should not be tolerated in any form. We believe we need to go farther than just focusing on the consequences. We must also find ways to prevent this behavior from occurring in the first place and create a new culture of what is acceptable when students decide to join new groups on campus. We need all of you to help create this new culture. You need to bring a heightened awareness among your students to the dangers of hazing and how the lack of looking out for fellow students can end a young life early, maybe even their own. We need all of you as leaders and mentors to these young men and women to ensure that your campus is safe for them to learn and live their lives. Stone would want us to be his voice and never leave him behind. We are counting on you to never leave any one of your students behind so no other family will endure the pain of losing a loved one like we did. Please, no more deaths from hazing. Thank you for helping us make this promise to our son, Stone. Thank you. Thank you uh, to the Fultz family, 
<clears throat> we'll take any questions that you might have. You can ask your uh, director questions to anybody you'd like to. Currently, what we have right now um, is if, if hazing can be an act of violence. And so when it is an act of violence under the 1219, which we call it, refer to it as, uh, then those uh, students actually can no longer come back to school and they're debarred from coming to other Ohio universities. And so we'll support that as well as we move forward with that if there's going to be a change in any of the Ohio Revised Code as a university president. So there could be a dismissal for lack of education? I believe so, yes. Yes, yeah. Well, for Central State, we do have policies, and for those students, we have a, a dean of students who put correspondences out to the entire student body, as well as from the president's office. We want to let people know how serious this is, and that we all stand in solidarity here. Sure. I want to start off, uh, let me just check some numbers. I want to read these numbers because I think they're very significant. Since January of this year, um, we have had 16,924 Ohioans with COVID hospitalized who had not been vaccinated. Let me give that again. Since January, there have been 16,924 of our fellow citizens hospitalized. None of them were vaccinated. We've had 205 who have been hospitalized who have, in fact, been vaccinated. If you look at the deaths, what we're reporting, and there's, these, these do lag behind, but this is what we, what, we, what we have. Of the deaths, people who've had COVID, since January, 6,812 um, not vaccinated, 34 vaccinated. Uh, these numbers are, are stunning. Uh, we're seeing them across the country. 99% of the hospitalizations, 99% of not the hospitalizations uh, for COVID are because that person was not, in fact, vaccinated. So this is an amazingly powerful tool. I think all of us share the goal of having all our children, whose families want them to, to be able to go to school five days a week, beginning in August or whenever the school starts, and to be able to complete the year and do that. We want to see kids in school. For that to happen, there's very important that anybody, any child who can be vaccinated, become vaccinated. Now, we know that those 11 and under at this point cannot be vaccinated. But I'm hopeful, it's, it's a hope, uh, that this fall or into early winter, that it will be possible then to vaccinate young children, uh, you know, younger, younger than 12 years of age. We know that not every child can be vaccinated today, and we know that not every child has been vaccinated, even those who have been, who, who can, in fact, be vaccinated. What we learned last winter was the importance of masking. And we really didn't know it uh, fully until we saw it play out through the year. And we saw it specifically in, in, in Ohio. We watched it. And when students were masked in a classroom, it did not spread. Um, it, it is clear, uh, in, in response to the question, uh, 
Uh, it is clear that we will need to let this decision be made by the parents and this decision be made by the schools. Uh, we have, throughout our history, been a very local government state, a very local school state. But as governor of the state, I have the obligation to share the best data that we have. And our health department, the health department of the state of Ohio, has the obligation to share the best data they have. And so what we have tried to do in the last few weeks is to have medical professionals brief the people of the state, brief the news media, but through you, brief the people of the state of Ohio on what the situation is. The numbers I just read about the hospitalizations are absolutely stunning. You know, if you, if you want to, uh, you know, stay out of the hospital, uh, get, the vac get the vaccine. Um, statistics are just ab absolutely overwhelming. So what our health, Dr. Vanderhoff, the two other doctors this morning who joined Dr. Vanderhoff, pediatricians, uh, I think their message uh, was, was very, very strong. And, and that is vaccination, uh, if that child can be vaccinated, getting that child vaccinated is your best protection. That child will be able and that school will be able to stay in school. Uh, that they'll be able to stay in schools five days a week. If the child cannot be vaccinated or is not vaccinated, that wearing the mask we learned last winter is extremely, extremely powerful. So you saw today that these three medical experts speaking on behalf of the Ohio Health Department uh, tell the people of the state of Ohio that these are two tools to be used if you want your child to stay in school. What we don't have is any experience of the COVID going through the state and kids in school not masking. Now, there may have been a school here or a school there, but by and large, last winter, last whole school year, we had kids who were masked. And what we saw when we went in and tested it, and we actually tested it, is that you saw very, very little uh, spread directly in the classroom. So schools will make their own decision. I'll make it very clear. This is local. Schools will make the decision. Parents will make the decision whether their individual child is going to wear that mask if the school doesn't elect to do it. Um, but the evidence is just absolutely overwhelming. You know, I desperately want to see our kids in school this year. We do not want to go through a year where they're in and out of school. We do not want to go through a year when many of them are remote. This is how we do it. We do it with vaccinations. We do it with masking. If we do those two things, vaccinations when the child can be vaccinated and masking for everybody who cannot be vaccinated, we will have a decent school year, kids will be able to stay in school, uh, and it's something I think that all Ohioans ought to be able to agree on that that is the, that is the goal. How many school owners will it take before they're, they're mandated? I'm sorry? Schools, how many outbreaks, how many child deaths will it take before they are mandated? Because I know there are schools that are not going to do it unless Yeah, look, let, let me be quite candid. Uh, I do not believe I have the ability today uh, to, to mandate that. I could make a smart comment, but I but I won't. Um, it is it, it, there is not there is not the, the appetite in this state today uh, for that kind of a mandate. Uh, we did it last year uh, with schools. It worked very very well. Um, there's not the appetite in this state to do it. I do not effectively have the ability to do that. But what I do have the ability to do, uh, and what our health department has the ability to do, it is to tell what the facts are. And let me just give, give one more fact. The quarantining issue. Quarantining goes back 
decades and maybe centuries, I suppose, uh, well, well predates COVID. And you saw what, we ha what happened last year. We had what we found out is that when kids were masked in a classroom, if Sally was even three feet away from Billy and Billy had COVID, we didn't see much spread. And so we were able for those uh, who were wearing masks in a classroom when kids were masked, we were able to say to them, you do not have to quarantine that child. Your son, your daughter does not have to be quarantined. Uh, and that was a pulling back from what the CDC said. And that was a pulling back from what's traditional. But we said when everyone was wearing a mask, you could do that. And so I would just, again, point that out to our schools and, and point that out to parents that as they make decisions uh, about, about that, that ch your child who plays sports, your child who's in the theater, your child who is in debate, whatever they love to do, there's nothing more important than the child being able to find something, a passion that they have and that they love to do. Uh, if you want your child to play sports, you know, not being vaccinated and not being masked in school is a, is a recipe for that not happening or for that to be certainly at least potentially interrupted. So much better chance everybody in the classroom is masked uh, because the protocols that will be uh, by the local health department are simply, are simply different based upon on that fact. So that's just a fact and uh, something for, for people to weigh. But we're at a point in, in, in this pandemic where information is out there. We're gonna to continue to put information out there, but we're at a point where these decisions must be left to the local community. They must be left to the parents. I'm not aware of anyone. Including yourself. Yeah, yeah, including myself. I'm not. I'm, look, I'm not. I'm not aware of, of, of anyone. Um, look, First Energy, uh, very important company to the state. Very important company to Akron community. Uh, my position during the campaign was very clear. Uh, they had two nuclear plants that might go go away. Uh, my position was that they need to continue to employ people, uh, that this was non-carbon uh, production of energy, and therefore it was, it was good. Um, you know, in regard to, um, you know, Mr. Randazzo, uh, everyone knew he worked for First Energy, and not, that was not a, not a question. Uh, he had also, everyone also knew he had worked for a lot of different companies. Uh, he'd worked both sides of it. He'd worked for the, for the utilities, he's worked for the consumers. Um, and so he was picked by our administration, picked by me, uh, for the reason that he had expertise in this, in this area. And he'd been on you know, both sides of it, under, understood the issues. So that's, that's, you know, that is why, why he was picked. Sound like my seventh grade teacher. Uh, I will tell you, I did not read every, go back and read it twice. I read it quickly. So I'm not, not going to tell you I studied it. I'm not going to tell you I'm an, uh, I'm an expert. So. That's correct. I only I only read it quickly, but I did focus on. Since you had called my office and asked questions about those two individuals, and that was the very question you asked, uh, I did go back and I certainly did look at those those sections. I, I would not recognize me from that. No, 
I would, I would not. Um, no. Well, I did not know that before we hired him. Um, I did not know that uh, until, and I'd have to check the date, but I think it was around October of 2020. And I, I believe that, that came in a, in a call uh, from Mr. Randazzo um, to my chief of staff. And she in turn informed me, I don't know the timing of that, but before he was he was hired, um, no, I did not, certainly did not know. Now, did I know that Sam Rodazzo worked for First Energy? Of course. Uh, my understanding was that that relationship was 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 done with. Uh, that he was actually, uh, I think, what we were told by him uh, was he was coming out of retirement. That's what I knew. So I'm going to follow up on that. In May and December of 2018, documents from First Energy Solutions and Bankruptcy listed companies that Sam Randazzo, that appear in Sam Randazzo's financial disclosures. Were you aware of just how recent his ties to First Energy were? No, but um, m m I knew he worked for First Energy. What I knew was that that relationship was over with. And that was, would have been the important thing to me, whether or not it had been six months or whatever the period of time it had been. Everybody knew Sam Rodazzo had worked for First Energy, so it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, an issue. Uh, the, my understanding was that had been terminated, that relationship had been terminated, and, and, and we, you know, we move on. I mean, look, Mr. Randazzo had asked, uh, by people on my team, is there a con do you have any conflict? These are standard questions that you're going to ask to to any any person. Anything going to embarrass the governor? Any any uh, any any conflicts? And uh, the answer he gave was no. Thought thought the relationship was over with. Never a secret that he had a relationship with them. No. No, it, no, that would, that, no. Didn't push me, no. Did they push them? I'm not aware of it, them pushing anybody. I'm not aware of that, no. Can you clarify, when you say that everybody knew Sam Randazzo worked for First Energy, in your head, I mean, what time frame are you talking about? What capacity of work are you talking about? When you say everybody, who are you talking about? People like you, I mean, people in the press corps, people around Capitol Square. I mean, Sam Randazzo was not some guy hiding hiding under a bush. I mean, everybody knew Sam Randazzo was a, here's what they knew. He's a subject matter expert, no, no, knows the issue very, very well. And he'd worked both sides. He, he had worked for consumers. He had worked for First Energy. That's what was known. Everybody knew that. I mean, it's not like, look, there, there, were, there were people who were opposed to him uh, and, you know, they were sending around all kinds of information, which we certainly, which we, you know, looked at, um, questioned him about, and none of that, it, but that was all public information. Well, I don't know if it's a dossier. I saw some papers uh, that I know were, were left in our office. Yeah, I saw I saw them at the time. Some papers. Governor, in front of your office announced that you're going to donate to the First Energy Donation Committee. I know you reported to those. Yes. Do you know how much money that is, and does that include funds donated by First Energy executives and their families? Yes. It'll include, here's what it will include, and I think the check has been written, and we probably, when we walk out of here, I can get you the total number. It's over $100,000. Uh, it, it includes a PAC money. Uh, it would include any, any executives. Do you know how much that goes? 
it, it would go to it would go back to the only campaigns that are still in existence, which is DeWine Houston for Ohio. And and it would have and it would have gone back it would have gone back to Wine for Ohio before that before John and I came together. So, you know, in that cycle, it would have included anything in that in that cycle as far as that that uh, that entity. No, I mean, look, we, we, <laughs> no. I have a question for the official back. You want to give me a break here? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, Who did you direct it to? Oh, please? Mr. Johnson, the president of the EAA, the IUC. Oh, that's me. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I know you had both of it one time. Okay. Um, Thank you for uh, having this briefing today. I wanted to ask, we mentioned culture a lot today, changing the culture, and especially within university students. How do you guys go about doing that? Because right now, telling on someone who is hazing isn't the cool thing to do. So how are you guys going about changing that culture? Thanks for the question. I'll just reflect on what Dr. Johnson said earlier. Uh, first, culture change is always hard. Uh, and, and two, we're professional educators. And, uh, and so we believe in the human spirit and their ability to see the greater good, the better good of people. And so I think as they learn that incidental hazing is not acceptable, serious hazing is not acceptable, will get you expelled uh, from the university and put in prison, um, that hopefully will begin a new discussion. But it, it, it is a culture change, it's not cute to treat people differently. It's not funny to have people drink too much alcohol. And uh, that requires a si significant investment of time, energy, and resources. And these presidents are absolutely committed to it. When you say education, do you mean taking classes? Do you mean holding, you know? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's more along the lines, and I'll let any president speak up if, if they have a different perspective, but it's more along the line of training. Uh, we do a lot of training with individualized sessions as opposed to an entire uh, class experience that would be, you know, three hours a week for 15 weeks or something. And with more so. hazing, are there any incentives for business students to speak up if they're in a situation like this to actually let you guys know what's going on? Yeah, we haven't, we haven't discussed the incentives part of it. And um, I, I've had discussions with a number of student affairs vice presidents. They're getting very creative about how to you know, bring peer pressure to bear on the hazing issue. Uh, I haven't heard them talk specifically about financial incentive or something, something of that, that nature. And the principals themselves, tell us what makes these permanent or gives them power? What makes these more in the sidelines that we're seeing? Up front? One of the principals is asking for a change in state law, uh, and that's principle number two, but um, the rest of them are these university presidents coming together with an absolute commitment to see a difference be made. And so uh, they're standing here as a united group uh, and talking uh, very seriously about making a culture change on university campuses. Do you see these being put into university charters or posts to make these more permanent? Yes, every, un, under the law, every university will have a new policy and the chancellor is charged with providing guidance uh, and standards, and so we will be uh, working with his office to make sure that those ideas are implemented on our campuses. Question for Dr. Johnson, you're dealing with such a large university, how do you go about changing the culture when you're dealing with that many students, that many off-campus students, right. and also, you know, we talk about these two high-profile cases, neither were at Ohio State, but you have to imagine that this is happening on your campus as well. Do you worry that the next case so a couple things. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, my background is both in the academy and also in industry. And so when I ran a hydropower company, if you don't put safety first, people get injured. And I think we all have learned what's happened over the last year with COVID and what we can do to educate around keeping yourselves. And we had a Buckeyes together. We are going to ex expand and say that together as Buckeyes towards safety for the entire campus, including hazing. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, you know, last year with COVID, we issued 57 emails. We had town hall meetings every month uh, that drew thousands of people. 
So I think the things that we learn from that, we will apply. And I've got a great team and a fabulous senior vice president uh, for student life and Melissa Shiver. So we'll be working very closely together to take all those learnings and apply them towards um, anti-hazing. Thank you. Yeah, I told you I wasn't sure of the exact date. Okay. It was a period of time. I know that the Ethnic Disclosed to the Securities and Exchange Commission in November about a payment made. So I'm wondering, did Laurel tell you I'm wondering if, if November was that. Did you, did you actually give out that information for a month, or do you think the disclosure came out in December for a payment made in the early June? Um, I, I don't know the date. I told you I didn't know the date. I don't. Okay. I, I don't know the date. I mean, the, the operable point was that, you know, before he was hired, we did not know that. I did not have any indication of, of that at all. Uh, well, all I knew was he worked for first, done work for First Energy, and that that was over with, and that he answered the questions that there, were, there was no, he had no, no conflict. So that's it. Uh, it was, it was, um, what, what, what is the date? December 18th, uh, I would have to go back and look at the calendar, but I don't, I don't really, I don't have specific recollection. You know, if you say that, that we, if you say that we met on that date, I'm sure we did, but, you know, look, this is a major employer in the state of Ohio. Um, you know. I have meetings with people who are CEOs all the time. Uh, this is a major industry, major company, but uh, I don't I don't have any specific recollection. But it would have been a more general conversation if it was December 2018. That is after the that is after the election, so it would have been, you know, looking to the future of Ohio. But I don't I don't have any specific recollection. Well, our understanding was, you say financial relationship. I would describe that as he worked for them. He did work for them. He was paid for that. We, we knew that. Everybody knew that. So there's no, there's no new information that's available at that point. So, you know, no new information as far as I was concerned. All right, thank you all. Thank you all very much. I want to thank the governor and uh, I'd like to thank the Pulse family specifically for your help today. And that'll conclude our press conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have all this. Thanks, everyone. We have part in the shade.